his religion will be brotherhood without the fatherhood of God, he will deceive even the elect. He will set up a counter church, which will be the ape of the church because he, the devil, is the ape of God. It will be the mystical body of the Antichrist that will in all externals resemble the church as the mystical body of Christ. In desperate need for God, he will induce modern man in his loneliness and frustration to hunger more and more for membership in his community that will give man enlargement of purpose without any need of personal amendment and without the admission of personal guilt. Catholic tradition teaches us that the Mass is not an invention of man. It was established by Christ who commanded his apostles to do this in memory of me. Although the traditional Latin Mass we have today was given to us by Christ, it does not look exactly as it did in the early Church. Over the centuries, the Church has developed rituals and prayers which she has added to enrich the Mass. However, it must be emphasized that with these changes, the Church has always been very faithful in preserving the essential nature of the Mass as it was given to us by Christ. The Council of Trent holds that the Canon of the Mass was composed partly of the very words of the Lord, partly of the traditions of the apostles, and also of the pious regulations of the holy pontiffs. The Church has the right to make legitimate adaptations to her liturgy. However, it is important to note that an accidental change, such as adding ceremonies to enrich the Mass, is far different than a substantial change that removes or alters part of the Mass to fit a changing theology. Attempts to make substantial changes to the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass are not a new development. There is always the temptation to change the substance of the Mass to please man. In the wake of the Protestant Revolt, the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass was under attack. New Protestant liturgies were being introduced across Europe. These new liturgies contained both accidental and substantial changes. The altars were replaced with tables. The priests turned around to face the people. Latin was discarded in favor of the native language. They removed all the prayers that contained doctrinal concepts that did not fit their new theology, such as transubstantiation and the Mass as a sacrifice to atone for sin. Even the changes they introduced that did not, strictly speaking, affect the validity of the Mass were nevertheless made to deny some point of Catholic doctrine. For example, Communion in the hand was introduced as a way of denying Christ's real presence in the Eucharist. There were even some Catholics who advocated changes to the Mass to appease the Protestants. To safeguard the Mass from the innovators who wanted to strip the Mass of its Catholic nature, Pope St. Pius V in 1570 fixed the Mass for all time in the papal bull Quo Primum. He writes in part that, Never at any time is anything to be added, subtracted, or changed in the Missal. This we determine and ordain to hold in perpetuity, that is, forever. After reading this bull, one would think the matter was settled. The Mass was never to be changed. Yet on April 4, 1969, Paul VI issued his Novus Ordo Misse, or New Order of Mass, which he made obligatory for use in the Latin Rite. This new Mass was quite a shock to the Catholic world. There were those who objected to the new Rite from the very beginning. In 1969, Cardinal Otto Viani and a group of Roman theologians wrote a short critical study of the New Order of Mass, which was called the Otto Viani Intervention. In this critical study, he observed that the New Order of Mass represents both as a whole and in its details a striking departure from the Catholic theology of the Mass as it was formulated in Session 22 of the Council of Trent. However, the voices of opposition were only a small minority, and in the end, most of the critics did come to accept the new Mass of Paul VI. There was good reason the Church had used the same rite of Mass for many centuries. So the obvious question to ask is, why was there suddenly a need to discard this ancient liturgy? The answer is ecumenism. 
The ecumenism of Vatican II was aimed at establishing a kind of fraternal union between Catholics and Protestants that did not involve conversion. This union would be based on emphasizing what was held in common and avoiding discussions of doctrinal differences. The traditional Latin Mass embodies the entire Catholic religion because it contains the entire teaching of Jesus Christ. The Holy Sacrifice of the Mass was therefore an obstacle to this new ecumenism. To the innovators of Vatican II, making the Mass more ecumenical meant removing those parts of the Mass to which the Protestants object. Archbishop Annibal Bonini was the secretary of the liturgical commission that created the new order of Mass. In a statement published in L'Oservato Romano, Bognini tells us what the goal of the new Mass would be. He states, We must strip from our Catholic prayers and from our Catholic liturgy everything which can be a stumbling block for our separated brethren. Pope Pius XII warned about the dangers of this new kind of ecumenism in his encyclical Humani Generis. He writes in part, Another danger is perceived which is all the more serious, because it is more concealed beneath a mask of virtue. There are many who, deploring disagreement among men and intellectual confusion, through an imprudent zeal for souls, are urged by a great and ardent desire to do away with the barrier that divides good and honest men. By setting aside questions which divide men, they aim not only at joining forces to repel the attacks of atheism, but also at reconciling things opposed to one another in the field of dogma. But some seem to consider as an obstacle to the restoration of fraternal union things founded on the laws and principles given by Christ, and likewise on institutions founded by him, or which are the defense and support of the integrity of the faith, and the removal of which would bring about union of all, but only to their own destruction. Some people have the false idea that the new Mass is just the old Mass, translated into the native language. Nothing could be further from the truth. The new order of Mass is an entirely new creation with an entirely new theology to go along with it. The objections to the new Mass are not based on a reluctance to change or just a preference for Latin, but rather on questions of doctrine and validity. All the changes to the liturgy have one thing in common, that is, the deliberate removal of Catholic doctrine. In other words, they removed all the parts of the Mass that were too Catholic. The best way to demonstrate that the new rite of Mass is an entirely new creation is to compare the prayers of the two rites side by side. The new order of Mass contains a seemingly endless number of options, which does make a side-by-side -side comparison more difficult. This seemingly endless number of options in the new rite is an ecumenical feature that allows each priest to customize the service to accommodate the faith of any given assembly. Therefore, this comparison will focus mainly on the three principal parts of the Mass, the offertory, the consecration, and the communion. We know that the Mass is an immolative sacrifice, that is to say, the Mass is a renewal of the sacrifice of Calvary. This means that like Calvary, it involves the sacrifice of a victim, and that victim is Jesus Christ. In the offertory, the victim is offered and the sacrifice is directed to a definite end. In the consecration, Christ becomes present on the altar. The communion represents the destruction of the victim and the sacrifice. Therefore, these three components, offertory, consecration, and communion, are all necessary to complete the sacrificial action. To fulfill the Sunday obligation of attending at Mass, the faithful must be present from the start of the offertory through the priest's communion. As each prayer is examined, ask yourself the question, would this prayer be acceptable to the Protestants before the change? Then, ask yourself, is the prayer acceptable to the Protestants after the change? Part 2. The Offertory Prayer for the Offering of the Bread in the Traditional Latin Mass Accept, O Holy Father, Almighty and Eternal God, this spotless host, which I, thy unworthy servant, offer unto thee, my living and true God, to atone for my numberless sins, offenses, and negligences, on behalf of all here present, and likewise for all faithful Christians living and dead, that it may profit me and them as a means of salvation unto life everlasting.
This prayer tells us that the Mass is first and foremost a sacrifice. It is a sacrifice offered to atone for our numberless sins, offenses, and negligences, and it is offered for the living and the dead. Every valid Mass replicates Calvary, so it follows that at every valid Mass, the work of redemption is performed. Jesus offers himself through the ministry of the priest as a sacrifice to atone for sin. Before examining the offertory prayers of the New Rite, it must be pointed out that it is no longer called an offertory. In the New Rite, it is called the preparation of the gifts. The term offertory had to go in the New Rite because it was a stumbling block for the Protestants. The 16th century Protestant reformer, Martin Luther, called the offertory an abomination, on account of which nearly everything sounds and reeks of oblation. In Luther's new service, he replaced the offertory with an instruction to prepare the bread and wine, just as Luther had done by changing the name, the modernists who wrote the new Mass were able to eliminate this undesirable concept. Prayer for the Offering of the Bread in the New Mass Blessed are you, Lord God of all creation, for through your goodness we have received the bread we offer you, fruit of the earth and work of human hands. It will become for us the bread of life. The prayer for the offering of the bread in the new rite bears absolutely no resemblance to the offertory prayer of the traditional rite. So where did it come from? The origin of the prayer is actually Jewish. This prayer was taken from the Jewish Seder table blessing. Blessed art thou, O Lord our God, King of the world, who bringeth to us bread from the earth. The concept of offering a sacrifice to atone for sin is abhorrent to the Protestants. The Protestants viewed their services as nothing more than a memorial meal. Removing the sacrifice for sin reduces the new rite to nothing more than a Protestant memorial meal. If the new rite is only a memorial meal, then a table blessing is most appropriate. Blessed art thou, O Lord our God, King of the world, who bringeth to us bread from the earth. It is the offertory that distinguishes the holy sacrifice of the Mass from a memorial meal. Not only does this prayer of the new rite not offer the sacrifice to atone for sin, the prayer never does clearly state the purpose of the offering. The prayer states, We have received the bread we offer you, but it never does state why it is offered. The Council of Trent teaches as a doctrine of faith that the Holy Mass is a true propitiatory sacrifice, that is to say, it is a sacrifice offered to atone for sin. Jesus died on the cross to atone for sin. The Mass is a renewal of Jesus' passion and death on the cross. If a rite is not offered to atone for sin, it cannot be the renewal of Jesus' passion and death on the cross. A liturgy that is not offered to atone for sin is therefore not a Mass. The term work of human hands introduces a question as to what is being offered. This expression was inserted into the text at the behest of Paul VI himself, who thought that the prayer should express the concept of man's work consecrated to the Lord. This idea, it turns out, originated in the writings of the Jesuit Pierre Teilhard de Chardin. Teilhard was a modernist, an evolutionist, and a pseudomystic. He had been silenced by the Holy Office in 1925, and forbidden to publish anything on religious matters. The source is Teilhard's 1918 essay, Mass on the World. To imply, as the new prayers do, that the work of human hands, like the bread and wine, is somehow consecrated at Mass, is another example of the modernist trick of substitution and devaluation. It destroys the reality of the consecration it degrades the real presence, and it renders meaningless the Church's teaching on the matter required for confecting the sacrament. It is also, at least implicitly, heretical. The prayer states, It will become for us the bread of life. Bread of life is another non-specific ecumenical term that can mean whatever one wants it to mean. Bread of life can refer to the bread we eat at everyday meals to sustain life. The general instruction for the Roman Missal tells us that the new Mass is the people of God called together with the priest presiding. 
This introduces some ambiguity as to who is performing the service, the priest or the assembly. In the traditional Latin Mass, the priest says the prayer first person singular, I, Accept, O Holy Father, Almighty and Eternal God, the spotless host which I, your unworthy servant, offer to you. In the new rite, the prayer is said, first person plural, we. We have received the bread we offer. This makes it unclear whether the new rite is offered through the special sacerdotal power of the priest or whether it is offered through the power of the assembly. It appears to assign to the assembly a priestly function that it has no power to exercise. This emphasis on the assembly performing the service is yet another Protestant concept introduced into the new rite. Prayer for the mixing of the water and wine in the traditional Latin Mass. O God, who hast established the nature of man in wondrous dignity, and still more admirably restored it, grant that through the mystery of this water and wine we may be made partakers of his divinity, who condescended to become partaker of our humanity, Jesus Christ, thy Son, our Lord, who liveth and reigneth with thee in the unity of the Holy Ghost, one God, world without end. Amen. Consider how this prayer begins. O God, who established the nature of man in wondrous dignity. Here the prayer refers to the creation of man by God. It reminds us that we were created in a state of wondrous dignity. Next the prayer says, and still more admirably restored it. This reminds us that we have fallen and lost that state of dignity in which we were created. This is the reason why we need a sacrifice to atone for sin. It is because we have fallen that we need a Redeemer to restore us to that state of innocence. Next, the prayer asks that we may be made partakers of His divinity. This refers to the reception of Holy Communion. Because when we receive the body and blood of Jesus Christ, we become partakers of His divinity. Next, the prayer says, Who condescended to become partaker of our humanity. This refers to the chief teaching of the Catholic Church about Jesus Christ, that He is God made man. Prayer for the mixing of the water and wine in the new Mass. By the mystery of this water and wine, may we come to share in the divinity of Christ, who humbled himself to share in our humanity. Notice what has been removed in the new rite. There is no mention of man's creation by God. There is no mention of his state of innocence, no mention of his fall. No mention of man's redemption. Why were these concepts removed? These doctrines were all obstacles to ecumenism. These are all concepts to which non-Catholics object, and therefore they had to go. Without a fall, you no longer need a sacrifice for sin. In fact, by removing the fall, you no longer need a Redeemer. Notice also that once these Catholic concepts have been removed, the prayer becomes ambiguous. To share in the divinity of Christ could even be interpreted in a New Age way. Prayer for the Offering of the Wine in the Traditional Latin Mass We offer thee, O Lord, the chalice of salvation, humbly begging of thy mercy that it may arise before thy divine majesty with a pleasing fragrance for our salvation and for that of the whole world. Prayer for the offering of the wine in the new Mass. Blessed are you, Lord God of all creation, for through your goodness we have received the wine we offer you, fruit of the vine and work of human hands. It will become our spiritual drink. Blessed art thou, O Lord our God, King of the world, who bringeth to us bread from the earth. This prayer is just another Jewish table blessing. It offers the wine, but it does not give a reason why the offering is made. It will become spiritual drink. Spiritual drink is yet another non-specific ecumenical term that can mean whatever one wants it to mean. Prayer beseeching God to accept our sacrifice in the traditional Latin Mass. 
In a humble spirit and with a contrite heart, may we be accepted by thee, O Lord, and may our sacrifice be offered in thy sight this day, as to please thee, O Lord God. This is one of only two prayers that remain intact from the traditional offertory prayers. Prayer beseeching God to accept our sacrifice in the new rite. With humble spirit and try heart, we accept you, O Lord. The new mass is still called a sacrifice, but the rite has been stripped of any hint that it is a sacrifice offered to atone for sin. At best, it is a sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. Remember that the Protestants are willing to call their services a sacrifice, but only a sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. They specifically refuse to call their services a sacrifice offered to atone for sin. Consider that this Anglican service is also called a sacrifice. We earnestly desire thy fatherly goodness, mercifully to accept this our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. The Mass as a sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving only, without also being offered to atone for sin, was specifically condemned at the Council of Trent. The Council of Trent states, If anyone says that the sacrifice of the Mass is one only of praise and thanksgiving, let him be anathema. Prayer to the Holy Ghost in the traditional Latin Mass. Come thou sanctifier, almighty and eternal God, and bless this sacrifice prepared for the glory of thy holy name. This prayer is an unambiguous profession of faith that the Holy Ghost is God. The prayer calls upon his name to bless the sacrifice. This is an acknowledgement that we need his intercession for our sacrifice to be acceptable. The prayer to the Holy Ghost has been entirely omitted in the new rite. Prayer for the washing of the fingers in the traditional Latin Mass. I will wash my hands among the innocent, and I will walk around thy altar, O God, to hear the voice of thy praise, and to tell all thy wondrous deeds. Lord, I love the beauty of thy house, and the place where thy glory dwells. Destroy not my soul with impious, O God, nor my life with men of blood, in whose hands there is iniquities, whose right hand is full of bribes. But as for me, I walk in my innocence. Rescue me and be gracious to me. My foot stands in the straight way. In the assemblies, I will bless thee, O Lord. This prayer teaches several very Catholic ideas. If there are innocent people, it follows that there are guilty people as well. Therefore, the prayer acknowledges that salvation is a struggle and all men will not be saved. Next, the prayer states, I will go around your altar, O Lord. An altar is for offering sacrifice. Next, the prayer states, I love the house in which you dwell. This is an explicit recognition of God's presence in his temple, more specifically, his real presence in the Eucharist. Prayer for the washing of the fingers in the new rite. Notice what has been removed in the new rite. There is no mention of our need for redemption. There is no mention of the temple of God or God's presence in this temple. No mention of an altar. It's of interest that the new rite takes place on a table rather than an altar. The tabernacle has been removed from that table and placed off to the side. The focus of the new rite appears to be centered on man rather than centered on God. The concept of God's presence in his temple has been removed because it was an obstacle to ecumenism. Prayer to the Trinity in the traditional Latin Mass. Accept, most holy Trinity, this offering which we are making to you in remembrance of the passion, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus Christ our Lord, and in honor of Blessed Mary, ever Virgin, Blessed John the Baptist, the holy apostles Peter and Paul and all the saints whose relics lie on the altar and of all the saints, that it may add to their honor and aid in our salvation, and may they deign to intercede in heaven for us who honor their memory here on earth, through the same Christ our Lord. Amen. This prayer is first an explicit profession of faith in the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. It is a profession of faith in the perpetual virginity of Mary and the intercessory power of the communion of saints. This prayer to the Trinity has been entirely omitted in the new rite. It is noteworthy that the prayer to the Holy Ghost is omitted, as well as the prayer to the Trinity. 
Why would these prayers be omitted in the new rite? It would appear that the new rite does not want to profess a belief in the Trinity, or the perpetual virginity of Mary, or the intercessory power of the saints. These are all doctrinal concepts to which non-Catholics object, and therefore they had to go in the new rite. The law of prayer determines the law of belief. Our prayer reflects our belief, and our beliefs are reflected in our prayer. Pope Pius XII wrote in Mediator Dei, The entire liturgy, therefore, has the Catholic faith as its content, inasmuch as it bears public witness to the faith of the Church. To accommodate ecumenism, the innovators removed from the new rite all the doctrinal concepts that are uniquely Catholic. If the liturgy bears witness to the faith of the Church, what, then, is the faith to which the new rite bears witness to? The Priest's Invitation to Pray in the Traditional Latin Mass Pray, brethren, that my sacrifice and yours may become acceptable to God the Father Almighty. May the Lord accept the sacrifice from your hands to the praise and glory of his name for our advantage and that of all his holy church. The Priest's Invitation to Pray in the New Rite Pray, my brothers and sisters, that my sacrifice and yours may be acceptable to God, the Almighty Father. May the Lord accept the sacrifice at your hands for the praise and glory of His name for our common good of all of us. The priest's invitation from the old mass, Orate Fratres, pray, brethren, that my sacrifice and yours may be acceptable to God the Father Almighty, was likewise deregulated. In the mass of Paul VI, it is one of the introductions or admonitions that, according to the new legislation, the priest is free to adapt to the actual situation of the community. So while conservative young Father Retro who likes to say the black and do the red, uses the old formula verbatim at one Mass. At the next Mass, his boss, warm and welcoming Father Chuck, is free to adapt the text spontaneously any way he sees fit. Especially since Father Chuck's new boss, it turns out, likes to do the same. Part 3. The Consecration we know that the Mass is an immolative sacrifice, that is to say, the Mass is a renewal of the sacrifice of Calvary. This means that like Calvary, it involves the sacrifice of a victim, and that victim is Jesus Christ. In the offertory, the victim is offered and the sacrifice is directed to a definite end. In the consecration, Christ becomes present on the altar. The communion represents the destruction of the victim and the sacrifice. Therefore, these three components, offertory, consecration, and communion, are all necessary to complete the sacrificial action. The Mass is the sacrificial action that contains the sacrament of the Eucharist. It is at the consecration that the miracle of the Mass occurs. The bread and wine are transformed into the body and blood of Jesus Christ. Every sacrament requires proper matter, form, and intention. The words of consecration are the form of the sacrament of the Eucharist. Prayer for the Consecration of the Bread in the Traditional Latin Mass Who the day before he suffered took bread into his holy and venerable hands, and having raised his eyes to heaven, to you, O God, his Almighty Father, giving thanks to you, he blessed it, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take ye all and eat, for this is my body. Notice that the prayer begins, who the day before he suffered. The focus of the prayer is not on the eating of a meal, but rather on Christ's suffering. Notice also that Christ raises his eyes to heaven. He raises his eyes to heaven to signify that he is offering sacrifice to his Almighty Father. In the traditional Mass, the consecration is part of a larger prayer called the Canon. The word Canon means fixed rule of prayer. In the new Mass, 
The canon has been replaced by four Eucharistic prayers from which the priest can choose. The multiple options are an ecumenical feature that allows each priest to choose the Eucharistic prayer that best fits the faith of any given assembly. Depending on which Eucharistic prayer is used, between 60 and 80 percent of the traditional Mass has simply been discarded. Prayer for the Consecration of the Bread in the New Mass, Eucharistic Prayer Number 4. For when the hour had come for him to be glorified by you, Father most holy, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. And while they were at supper, he took bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and eat of it, for this is my body which will be given up for you. The form for the consecration of the bread, this is my body, has been retained in the new mass. Note, however, that what is done takes place while they were at supper. Note also that Jesus never raises his eyes to heaven to offer sacrifice. It is not clear whether Jesus is instituting a sacrament or just eating the Paschal meal. All that is clear in Eucharistic prayer number four is, while they were at supper, Jesus said the blessing. The prayer tells us that Jesus was glorified by the Father and he loved his own. What does it mean to be glorified by the Father or to show love? This is non-specific ecumenical language that can mean whatever one wants it to mean. Prayer for the Consecration of the Wine in the Traditional Latin Mass In like manner when supper was done, taking also this excellent chalice into his holy and venerable hands, again giving thanks to thee, he blessed it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take ye all and drink of this. For this is the chalice of my blood of the new and eternal covenant, the mystery of faith which shall be shed for you and for many unto the forgiveness of sins. Note how the prayer begins, when supper was done. The prayer emphasizes the fact that the actions of Christ were not part of the supper. What is done is a sacrificial act that occurs after the Paschal meal was over. The words, mystery of faith, are a profession of faith that the bread and wine are transformed into the body and blood of Jesus Christ. Prayer for the Consecration of the Wine in the New Mass, Eucharistic Prayer Number 4. In a similar way, taking the chalice filled with the fruit of the vine, he gave thanks and gave the chalice to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and drink from it. For this is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant, which will be poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me. Note that the words mystery of faith are no longer part of the formula. The words are still there, but they have been moved outside the consecration, and their meaning has changed. In the new rite, after the consecration is over, the priest proclaims the mystery of faith, to which the people reply, Christ has died, Christ has risen, Christ will come again. The mystery of faith. We proclaim your death, O Lord, and profess your resurrection until you come again. What is the mystery of faith? In the traditional Latin Mass, there is no doubt what the mystery of faith is. The mystery of faith is Christ's presence on the altar under the appearance of bread and wine. The Catechism of the Council of Trent teaches, 
The words mystery of faith, which are subjoined, do not exclude the reality, but signify that what lies hidden and concealed far removed from the perception of the eye is to be believed with firm faith. In the new Mass, the words mystery of faith no longer refer to the transformation of the bread and wine into the body and blood of Christ. The meaning has been changed to a gospel narrative. Christ has died, risen, and will someday come again. This is at least an implied denial of Christ's real presence in the Eucharist. It is interesting to note that the memorial acclamation appears to be taken from the Lutheran Book of Worship. Consider the similarities between the new Mass and a Lutheran service. Christ is dying. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. A clear profession of faith that the bread and wine are transformed into the body and blood of Christ would be an obstacle to ecumenism, and therefore it had to go. The fact that Christ has died, Christ has risen, and will someday come again, is not much of a mystery, but it is acceptable to non-Catholics. In the general instruction to the new order of Mass, just as in the Lutheran service, the words of consecration are referred to as the institution narrative. The phrase institution narrative is completely alien to Catholic theology. A narrative is a story. To call the consecration a narrative introduces a doubt. Is the priest offering sacrifice, or is he just telling the story of the Last Supper? This is the reason why the words mystery of faith had to be removed from the traditional consecration formula. A profession of faith would be out of place in the middle of a story. When a properly ordained minister uses proper matter and form to perform a sacrament, it is an external sign that he possesses the proper internal intention required to confect the sacrament. However, if a minister were to perform a sacrament in a setting that clearly denies the nature of the sacrament, despite the use of proper matter and form, the sacrament would be invalid. To place the words of consecration under the heading institution narrative is an indication of just such a denial. The priest is no longer pronouncing a sacramental formula in the person of Christ. Now he is just reading the story of the Last Supper. There can be no sacrament confected if the priest is only retelling a story. It is at the consecration that the miracle of the Mass occurs. The bread and wine are transformed into the body and blood of Jesus Christ. This is what is meant by Christ's true presence. The general instruction for the new Mass tells us that Christ is really present in the very liturgical assembly gathered in his name, in the person of the minister, in his words, and indeed substantially and continuously under the Eucharistic species. This degrades the doctrine of Christ's true presence in the Eucharist by introducing the idea that Christ is present in many different ways. The modernists who wrote the new liturgy cleverly avoided any clear profession of faith that the bread and wine are transformed into the body and blood of Jesus Christ. Instead, the faithful are presented with a choice of different ways in which to understand Christ's presence. Christ is present in the Eucharist the same way he is present in the assembly or in the minister. Remember the dictum, the law of prayer determines the law of belief. A change in the law of prayer necessarily affects a change in belief. It should therefore not surprise anyone that surveys of U.S. Catholics show that 70% do not believe in the traditional Catholic teaching on the Eucharist. The law of prayer determines the law of belief. A change in the prayers of the new Mass has produced an inevitable and predictable change in belief. Part 4. The Communion we know that the Mass is an immolative sacrifice. That is to say, the Mass is a renewal of the sacrifice of Calvary. This means that like Calvary, it involves the sacrifice of a victim, and that victim is Jesus Christ. In the offertory, the victim is offered and the sacrifice is directed to a definite end. In the consecration, Christ becomes present on the altar. The communion represents the destruction of the victim and the sacrifice. Therefore, these three components, offertory, consecration, and communion, are all necessary to complete the sacrificial action. The third principal part of the Mass, 
the communion. Note that the communion prayers of the new Mass occur in a slightly different order than they occur in the traditional Mass. To allow for a side-by-side -side comparison of the two rites, all the prayers will be examined in the order in which they occur in the traditional Mass. The Lord's Prayer in the Traditional Latin Mass Let us pray. Prompted by saving precepts and taught by thy divine teaching, we dare say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. The Lord's Prayer in the New Mass At the Savior's command, informed by divine teaching, we dare to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. The communion rite begins with the Lord's Prayer in the traditional Mass as well as the new Mass. However, in the new Mass, they have added the Protestant prayer, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory. The power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Compare this to the Lord's Prayer from a Lutheran service. But deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. There is nothing wrong with those words in and of themselves. However, they are not Christ's words. They are a Protestant addition to the Lord's Prayer, and they serve to give the new Mass a Protestant flavor. The Libera Nos, or Embolism Prayer, in the traditional Latin Mass. Deliver us, we beseech thee, O Lord, from all evils, past, present, and to come, and by the intercession of the blessed and glorious Mary, ever Virgin, Mother of God, together with the blessed Apostles, Peter and Paul, and Andrew, and all the saints. Grant of thy goodness, peace in our days, that aided by the richness of thy mercy, we may be always free from sin and safe from all disturbance. The priest genuflects and breaks the sacred host. Through the same Jesus Christ, thy Son, our Lord, who liveth and reigneth with thee in the unity of the Holy Ghost, God, world without end. Amen. This prayer expresses many uniquely Catholic beliefs. It professes a belief in the intercessory power of Mary and the saints. It also expresses belief in the virginity of Mary, as well as acknowledging her as the mother of God. The Embolism Prayer in the New Mass Deliver us, Lord, we pray, from every evil. Graciously grant peace in our days that by the help of your mercy we may be always free from sin and safe from all distress as we await the blessed hope and the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Notice what has been removed from this prayer. This prayer in the new rite no longer professes a faith in the virginity of Mary. It does not acknowledge her as the mother of God, and it does not invoke the saints. These are all concepts to which Protestants object, and therefore they had to go. Also note that the priest does not break the host during the embolism prayer. In the new Mass, the fraction and commingling occur at the same time during the Agnus Dei. The Priest's Greeting in the Traditional Latin Mass May the peace of the Lord be always with you and with your spirit. The greeting in the new Mass is essentially the same. The peace of the Lord be with you always. And with your spirit. The commingling prayer in the traditional Latin Mass. May the mingling and consecration of the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ help us who receive it unto life everlasting. Prayer for the fraction and commingling in the new Mass. May this mingling of the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ bring eternal life to us who receive it. On the surface, 
This prayer may seem to be the same as it is in the traditional rite. However, there is a significant word missing. The word consecration has disappeared in the new rite. Remember that the Protestants do not accept the Catholic theology of the consecration. The word consecration was therefore a stumbling block to ecumenism, and consequently, it had to go. The On You Stay in the Traditional Latin Mass Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world, have mercy on us. Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world, have mercy on us. Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world, grant us peace. The On You Stay in the New Mass The On You Stay is essentially the same in the New Mass. The New Mass does retain some of the outer appearances of the Old Mass, but the only prayers left intact were prayers that have always been acceptable to the Protestants. The 16th century Protestant reformers did not create new liturgies out of whole cloth. They started with the Catholic Mass and then removed the parts they didn't like. Just like the Protestants had done, the modernists who wrote the new Mass kept some of the parts of the Catholic Mass intact. They kept prayers such as the Introit, Epistle, Gospel, Santus, the Lord's Prayer, and the Agnus Dei, or Lamb of God. It was only the prayers that are uniquely Catholic that had to go. But those are the very prayers that distinguish a Catholic Mass from a Protestant Supper. Prayer for Peace and Unity in the Traditional Latin Mass O Lord Jesus Christ, who has said to thy apostles, Peace I leave you, my peace I give you. Regard not my sins, but the faith of thy church, and deign to give her peace and unity according to thy will, who livest and reignest, God, world without end. Amen. Prayer for Peace and Unity in the New Mass Lord Jesus Christ, who said to your apostles, Peace I leave you, my peace I give you. Look not on our sins, but on the faith of your church, and graciously grant her peace and unity in accordance with your will, who live and reign forever and ever. The prayer for peace and unity may seem to be the same in the new Mass as it is in the traditional Mass. However, there is one notable difference. In the traditional Mass, the prayer is said, first person singular, while in the new Mass, the prayer is said, first person plural. Regard not my sins has been changed to regard not our sins. This is in keeping with the theology of the new mass, which seeks to eliminate the distinction between the priest and the assembly. The kiss of peace in the traditional Latin mass is only given at a solemn high mass. The kiss of peace is given by the celebrant to the deacon and from the deacon to the other ordained clergy in descending hierarchical order it is never given to the assembly. The kiss of peace, similar fraternal love which would exist between all Christians. The sign of peace in the new mass. Peace of the Lord be with you always. And with your Let us offer each other the sign of peace. In the new mass, the minister instructs the assembly to give each other the sign of peace. They may say hello, wish each other well, shake hands, hug, and even kiss. This commotion introduces a break in the solemn atmosphere of the mass, and much like a Protestant service, it places an emphasis on the role of the assembly in the service. It is more conducive to a group of friends gathering to eat a meal or have a party than offer sacrifice. 
It further solidifies the idea of the Mass as nothing more than a Protestant-style supper. The first of two communion preparatory prayers in the traditional Latin Mass. O Lord Jesus Christ, Son of the living God, who by the will of the Father, with the cooperation of the Holy Ghost, have by your death given life to the world, deliver me by this your most sacred body and blood from all my sins, from every evil. Make me always cling to thy commandments, and never permit me to be separated from thee, who, with the same God the Father and the Holy Ghost, livest and reignest, God, world without end. Amen. In this prayer, the priest acknowledges his sin and unworthiness. Here again is the idea of reconciliation. This is a consistent theme throughout the traditional Mass. That is, the reconciliation between a holy God and a sinful man. In the new Mass, this prayer is optional. The priest chooses only one of the two preparatory prayers. The Second Communion Preparatory Prayer in the Traditional Latin Mass Let not the partaking of thy body, O Lord Jesus Christ, which I, though unworthy, presume to receive, turn to my judgment and condemnation, but through your goodness may it become a safeguard and effective remedy, both of soul and body, who livest and reignest with God the Father in the unity of the Holy Ghost, God, world without end. Amen. Optional Communion Preparatory Prayer Number 2 in the New Mass May the receiving of your body and blood, Lord Jesus Christ, not bring me to judgment and condemnation, but through your loving mercy be a protection in mind and body and a healing remedy. In the traditional Mass, the priest prays, Let not the partaking of thy body, O Lord Jesus Christ, which I, though unworthy, presume to receive. In the new Mass, the phrase, which I, though unworthy, has been removed. To focus on one's worthiness to receive communion would be an obstacle to ecumenism, and therefore it had to go. Note that the prayer does talk about receiving the body and blood of Christ. However, to accommodate the Protestants, the innovators strip the new Mass of any clear profession of faith that Jesus Christ is truly present in the Eucharist. Without a clear profession of faith in transubstantiation, and in the absence of the traditional offertory prayers, to receive the body and blood of Christ could be understood in accord with the Protestant concept of the Eucharist. Consider that the Anglican service also has a prayer that talks about receiving the body and blood of Christ. That we, receiving them according to thy Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ's holy institution in remembrance of his death and passion, may be partakers of his most blessed body and blood. Remember that the Anglicans deny the Catholic teaching of transubstantiation. Article 28 from the Anglican Common Book of Worship states, The body of Christ is given, taken, and eaten in the supper only after a heavenly and spiritual manner. The Protestant reformer, Thomas Cramner, insisted that the bread and wine in the Anglican service are not themselves transformed into the body and blood of Christ. To Cramner, the bread and wine will only become the presence of Christ so that the assembly can be spiritually nourished. There is nothing in the new order of Mass that is incompatible with this Protestant understanding of the Eucharist. Notice also that the word soul has been removed from the prayer soul and body has been changed to mind and body. Mind and soul are not the same thing. The soul is spirit and the mind and body are both physical. The prayer asks that this communion be a healing remedy. Not a spiritual healing, but only a physical healing. Evidently, the faithful can expect no more benefit from eating this bread than the physical benefit which they obtain from the bread of everyday meals, that is, physical health. I will take the bread of heaven and call upon the name of the Lord. This prayer is omitted in the new rite. The prayer, Domine non sum dignus, or Lord I am not worthy, in the traditional Latin Mass. Lord I am not worthy that thou should come under my roof, but only say the word and my soul shall be healed. Lord, I am not worthy that thou should come under my roof, but only say the word, and my soul shall be healed. Lord, I am not worthy that thou should come under my roof, 
but only say the word and my soul shall be healed. In the traditional Latin Mass, there is a distinction made between the priest's communion and the communion of the faithful. It is the priest's communion which completes the sacrificial action. Although it is commendable for the faithful to receive communion, it is not an essential part of the sacrifice. The priest says the prayer, Lord, I am not worthy, three times before he receives communion. The priest will repeat this prayer three more times before the communion of the faithful. In the new Mass, the communion of the priest and people are combined. The prayer, Lord, I am not worthy, is said only once, and it is said by the priest and people together. The priest and people then receive communion at the same time. This is in keeping with the theology of the new Mass. Remember that the general instruction for the new Mass tells us that the Mass is the assembly of the people, and so it follows that the communion rite would make no distinction between the communion of the priest and that of the assembly. The Priest's Communion in the Traditional Latin Mass May the body of our Lord Jesus Christ preserve my soul unto life everlasting. What return shall I make to the Lord for all that he has given me? I will take the chalice of salvation, and I will call upon the name of the Lord. Praising will I call upon the Lord, and I shall be saved from all my enemies. This prayer is omitted in the new Mass. May the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ preserve my soul unto life everlasting. The communion of the faithful begins with the confidier in the traditional Latin Mass. I confess to Almighty God, to Blessed Mary ever Virgin, to Blessed Michael the Archangel, to Blessed John the Baptist, to the Holy Apostles Peter and Paul, and to all the saints, and to you, Father, that I have sinned exceedingly in thought, word, and deed, through my fault, through my fault, through my most grievous fault, Therefore I beseech Blessed Mary Ever Virgin, Blessed Michael the Archangel, Blessed John the Baptist, and the Holy Apostles Peter and Paul, and all the saints, and you, Father, to pray the Lord our God for me. Before communion is distributed in the traditional Mass, the server, on behalf of the people, recites the Confidior, which is a public confession of sin. Then the priest turns faces the people, and pronounces an absolution. May Almighty God have mercy on you, forgive you your sins, and bring you to life everlasting. May the Almighty and merciful Lord grant you pardon, absolution, and remission of your sins. Even though this is not a sacramental absolution, it is an expression of the Catholic teaching that one must be in the state of grace to receive the Eucharist. In the New Mass, not only have they eliminated the confession and absolution before receiving communion, Canon 844.4 of the 1983 Code of Canon Law actually allows the administration of Holy Communion to non-Catholics. To give Holy Communion to a non-Catholic has always been considered a mortal sin and condemned under pain of excommunication. This is because, among other things, it implicitly denies the dogma, outside the Catholic Church, there is no salvation. Communion of the Faithful in the Traditional Latin Mass Behold the Lamb of God, behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Lord, I am not worthy that thou shouldst come under my roof, but only say the word, and my soul will be healed. Lord, I am not worthy that thou shouldst come under my roof, but only say the word, and my soul will be healed. Lord, I am not worthy that thou shouldst come under my roof, but only say the word, and my soul will be healed. When we talk about the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, it brings to mind the idea of sacrifice. We are reminded of the Passover Lamb who suffered death to deliver the people from death, and Jesus Christ, who is our Passover, and suffered death to deliver us from our sins. The Combined Communion of Priest and People in the New Mass Behold, the Lamb of God. Behold him who takes away the sins of the world. 
Blessed are those called to the supper of the Lamb. Lord, I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof, but only say the word and my soul shall be healed. The Mass is not the supper of the Lamb. The Catholic Mass is the true and special sacrifice of the new law. In it, Jesus Christ, by ministry of the priest, offers his body and blood to God the Father under the appearance of bread and wine, by a mystical immolation in an unbloody manner, for a renewal and memorial of the sacrifice of the cross. A supper is how Protestants view their services. The phrase, Lord's Supper, was used by the 16th century Protestant reformers to distinguish their new services from a Catholic Mass. This prayer in the new rite seems to introduce the concept of sacrifice when it talks about the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, but the idea of sacrifice is quickly removed by calling it a supper. Just before the faithful receive communion, they are reminded that they are not at a Catholic sacrifice, but only a Protestant-style memorial supper, the Supper of the Lamb. May the body of Christ keep me safe for eternal life. May the blood of Christ keep me safe for eternal life. In the traditional Mass, the priest prays, May the body of our Lord Jesus Christ preserve my soul unto life everlasting. Note that in the new rite, the word soul has disappeared. Distributing Communion in the Traditional Latin Mass The priest makes the sign of the cross with the host and says, May the body of our Lord Jesus Christ preserve your soul unto life everlasting. Amen. Distributing Communion in the New Mass While distributing communion in the new mass, the priest holds up the host and says, The body of Christ. For we are part the of, of all Christ. that is. Note that the priest does not say, This is the body of Christ, but only body of Christ. In typical modernist fashion, this prayer is unclear in its meaning. The phrase, body of Christ, can refer to the Eucharist as the body of Christ, or it can refer to the assembly as the body of Christ. So what then does the phrase body of Christ mean? An official newsletter of the Bishop's Committee on the Liturgy states, the use of the phrase body of Christ, amen, in the communion rite asserts in a very forceful way the presence and role of the community. The minister acknowledges who the person is by reason of baptism and confirmation, and what the community is and does in the liturgical action. To accommodate ecumenism and make the new Mass acceptable to the Protestants, the innovators carefully avoided making a clear distinction between the physical body of Christ in the Eucharist and his mystical body, which is the Church. Apart from the prayers, the most obvious difference between the two communion rites is that in the traditional Mass, the people receive communion on their tongues, while in the new Mass, the people receive communion in their hand. This change speaks volumes about how the Eucharist is perceived in the new Mass. Keep in mind that the 16th century Protestant, Thomas Cramner, introduced communion in the hand as a way of denying Christ's true presence in the Eucharist. However, the modernists who wrote the new Mass went a step further than their 16th century counterparts by removing the communion rails and introducing standing rather than kneeling to receive communion. The communion rails serve as a barrier between the priest and the people, between the sacred and the earthly. The removal of the communion rails signifies that there is no real difference between the priest and the people. The disappearance of communion rails signify not only a removal of the sharp distinction between clergy and laity, Eliminating the distinction between the priest and the assembly is a consistent theme throughout the new Mass. Part 5. The New Rite of Holy Orders The Catholic Church was founded by Jesus Christ through His Apostles, and from the time of the Apostles to the present day, the Church has been governed by an unbroken chain of their lawful successors. This apostolic succession is transmitted 
through the sacrament of holy orders. There are seven sacraments instituted by Christ. Baptism and matrimony do not absolutely require a priest for the sacrament to be valid. As for the other five sacraments, that is, confirmation, penance, holy Eucharist, extreme unction, and holy orders, in addition to matter and form, a validly ordained priest or bishop is required. Holy orders is a sacrament through which men are raised to the priesthood. Therefore, holy orders is a sacrament upon which these five sacraments depend. It is worth noting that these are the five sacraments that Protestants reject. Only a bishop can administer the sacrament of holy orders, because only a bishop is in possession of the fullness of the priesthood. Therefore, it is in the bishop that apostolic succession resides. The Catechism of the Council of Trent states, Beyond all doubt, it is to the bishop that the administration of orders belongs, as is easily proven by the authority of Holy Scripture, by most certain tradition, by the testimony of all the fathers, by the decrees of the councils, and by the usage and practice of Holy Church. It is true that permission has been granted to some abbots, occasionally, to administer those orders that are minor and not sacred. Yet there is no doubt whatever that it is the proper office of the bishop, and of the bishop alone, to confer the orders called holy or major. Since a valid mass requires a validly ordained minister, it is of great concern that in 1968, after the Second Vatican Council had done its work, Paul VI introduced a radically new rite for ordaining priests and bishops. With the introduction of this radically new sacramental rite, it becomes necessary to ask the question, what is necessary to confect a valid sacrament? To have a valid sacrament, one must have valid matter and form. The matter of the sacrament is the visible element such as water, oil, bread, wine, or in the case of holy orders, the matter consists in a ritual of the imposition or laying out of hands. The form of the sacrament is the words that accompany the matter. For example, in the case of baptism, the form would be, I baptize thee in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. To pour water over someone's head can mean any number of things. It could be done to give someone a bath, or perhaps to wake them up. It is therefore the words of the form that determine what the application of the matter will be. This is why it is only when the matter is accompanied by the corresponding form that a sacrament can be confected. Pope Leo XIII, Apostolic Curie, on the validity of Anglican orders. Although the signification ought to be found in the whole essential rite, that is to say, in the matter and the form, it still pertains chiefly to the form, since the matter is the part which is not determined by itself, but which is determined by the form. And this appears still more clearly in the sacrament of orders, the matter of which, in so far as we have to consider it in this case, is the imposition of hands, which indeed by itself signifies nothing definite, and is equally used for several orders and for confirmation. Although there are problems with the new rite for ordaining priests and bishops, since it is in the bishop that apostolic succession resides, it is the right for the consecration of a bishop that is most critical. In Paul VI's new rite for ordaining bishops, they maintain the matter of the sacrament, which is the laying on of hands. However, they radically change the form. In fairness, it must be noted that a change in the form does not automatically invalidate a sacrament. Christ did not give us the exact form for the consecration of a bishop. However, because it is the words of the form that determine the application of the matter, although the words of the form may vary, they must contain the same substantial meaning that Christ established. Pius XII makes this point in his apostolic constitution, Sacramentum Ordinis. He writes, As the Council of Trent teaches, the seven sacraments of the new law were all instituted by Jesus Christ our Lord, and the Church has no power over the substance of the sacraments, that is, over those things which, with the source of divine revelation as a witness, Christ the Lord himself decreed to be preserved in a sacramental sign. The Church has the right to make changes to her liturgy, provided that those changes do not alter the substance of the sacrament. Therefore, 
The question to be asked is, does the form in Paul VI's new rite for ordaining bishops change the substance of the sacrament? In other words, does the form in Paul VI's new rite have the same meaning as the form in the traditional rite? To answer this question, consider the forms of the two rites side by side. The form for the consecration of a bishop in the traditional rite. Complete in thy priest the fullness of thy ministry, and having clothed him with all splendor, sanctify him by the dew of heavenly anointing. The form for the ordination of a bishop in Paul the Sixth New Rite. Pour out now upon these chosen ones that power which is from you, the governing spirit, whom you gave to your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, the spirit whom you bestowed upon the holy apostles who established the church in each place as your sanctuary for the glory and unceasing praise of your name. Do these two forms mean the same thing? In the traditional rite we have, complete in thy priest the fullness of thy ministry, while in the new rite we have, pour forth upon this chosen one that power which is from you, the governing spirit. Does the phrase governing spirit mean the same thing as being filled with the fullness of the priesthood? It is not exactly clear what governing spirit actually means. It could be understood to mean several different things. Does it mean that the person to be ordained will be raised to the fullness of the priesthood? Or does governing spirit mean that the person is appointed as a kind of overseer for the flock? In typical modernist fashion, the meaning of governing spirit is left deliberately unclear. It is a basic principle of sacramental theology that the form must be clear and have only one possible meaning. In Pius XII's Apostolic Constitution, Sacramentum Ordinis, he lays out the requirements for the form used in the Sacrament of Holy Orders. He writes, The form, and only the form, is the words which determine the application of this matter, which univocally signify the sacramental effect, namely, the power of order and the grace of the Holy Spirit. Pius XII tells us that the form for the consecration of a bishop must signify the sacramental effect, namely, the power of order and the grace of the Holy Ghost. And this signification must be univocal, that is to say, it must have only one possible meaning. Um, so we went from that to governing spirit. Yes. So that was the, 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 the phrase that we're looking at, but this is still not um, univocal by definition. And, and why would you argue that? Father. Well, what does it mean? Uh, the the uh, how is that uh, to be understood? You know. Uh, well, you know, a uh, bishop governs the church. A governing the, spirit. Uh, Joe that? Biden governs the Senate, maybe, <laughs> and and he's got the governing spirit. <laughs> but it's not the problem. Is it's not standard theological language that tells you what uh, a bishop does. If anything, all it it it, it doesn't convey the uh, idea of a sacrament as much as it, it, it might convey the idea of some sort of a jurisdiction, which uh, obviously a bishop has, but that's not the whole story. And you talked about having a dozen possible meetings uh, for governing spirit. Where were some of your sources for these meetings? Oh, before? well, I mean, uh, you, uh, again, it was a real rabbit hole. Uh, you uh, found the different explanations that, say, Dom Bott tried to give uh, in uh, his, his explanation in Otizia magazine. Uh, you uh, look at how it's understood in Psalm 50, uh, where, uh, where it occurs. The, uh, you see maybe how different fathers of the church used it. And uh, what happens is I went through a whole bunch of them, at least a dozen, all these different sources. And I went through a dozen sources and came up with a dozen different meanings. So you, you end up with language in the essential sacramental form for Episcopal consecration where it is, is uh, virtually impossible to say with certainty and affirm with a straight face uh, what it actually means. The meaning of governing spirit may be unclear, however, Paul VI, new rite, does still contain the terms bishop and high priest. Grant, O Father, knower of all hearts, that these your servants, whom you've chosen for the office of bishop, may shepherd your holy people, 
serving you night and day. May they fulfill before you without reproach the ministry of the high priesthood. This does not help the validity of the new ordination rite for two reasons. First, the terms bishop and high priest are not part of the essential sacramental form, and second, the term bishop must possess the Catholic understanding of a bishop. The surrounding ceremonies of the new rite have been stripped of every reference to the Catholic understanding of a bishop. Nowhere in the new rite is the power of a Catholic bishop clearly specified outside of his role in governing the flock. Consider that the Anglican Church also claims to have priests and bishops. The Reformers in England composed new ordination rites that maintained the titles priest and bishop. However, the new ordination rite must be in agreement with the 39 articles of the Anglican faith. Among other things, these 39 articles specifically deny the Catholic concept of a bishop. The Anglican rite makes it clear that although they use the terms priest and bishop, these terms mean entirely different things to the Anglicans than they do to the Catholics. Consider the words of Pope Leo XIII in Apostolic G. Curie on the validity of Anglican orders. Any words in the Anglican ordinal, as it now is, which lend themselves to ambiguity, cannot be taken in the same sense as they possess in the Catholic rite, for once a new rite has been introduced, in which, as we have seen, the sacrament of orders is adulterated or denied, and from which all idea of consecration and sacrifice has been rejected, the formula, receive the Holy Ghost, no longer holds good, because the Spirit is infused into the soul with the grace of the sacrament, and so the words for the office and work of a priest or bishop and the like no longer hold good, but remain as words without the reality which Christ instituted. The Anglican rite of ordination mimics the Catholic rite. However, as Pope Leo XIII points out, the term bishop has an entirely different meaning for the Anglicans than it does for the Catholics. This becomes evident from an examination of the surrounding ceremonies of the Anglican Rite, from which has been deliberately removed every reference to the Catholic understanding of a bishop. Paul VI, new Episcopal Rite of Ordination, does exactly the same thing as the Anglican Rite. It maintains the titles bishop and high priest, but removes from the surrounding ceremony every reference to the Catholic understanding of a bishop. This new rite brings the role of a bishop in line with the Protestant understanding of a bishop. The role of a bishop has been reduced to that of an overseer, who is ordained to preside over the liturgy. Consider some of the more notable changes to the surrounding ceremony of Paul VI's new rite. The first problem is the consecrator's homily is given under the heading, Consent of the People. With their applause, the people give their assent to the Pope's choosing of bishops-elect Reed and O'Connell to their new office. The idea that a bishop is appointed by the consent of the people is an entirely Protestant concept. A Catholic bishop is appointed by the authority of the Pope, who represents Jesus Christ on earth. Did Jesus Christ ask the Jews for their consent when he appointed his apostles? Should the teacher ask for the consent of the student? The traditional rite of Episcopal consecration begins with an oath. At this time, the bishop-elect will kneel at the foot of the altar before Bishop Carmona and take his oath, which is a profession of faith, to be faithful to the Holy Catholic faith. In this oath, the candidate swears, among other things, I shall observe with all my strength, and I shall cause to be observed by others, the rules of the Holy Fathers, the apostolic decrees, ordinances or dispositions, reservations, provisions, and mandates. This oath is totally omitted in the new rite. One would be hard pressed to find a bishop in the new church who would even attempt to cause anyone to observe any rules. Now that he has completed the oath, the bishop-elect returns to his place and is seated, and the examination begins. Wilt thou reverently receive, teach, and keep 
the traditions of the Orthodox Fathers and the decrees of the Holy Apostolic See. To each question, the bishop-elect rising and responding, I will. The Examination in Paul VI, New Right. You resolve to guard the deposit of faith entire and incorrupt, is handed down by the apostles, preserved in the church everywhere and at all times. I do. In the traditional rite we have, will you keep and teach with reverence the traditions of the Orthodox Fathers and the doctrinal constitutions of the Holy and Apostolic See, while in the new rite we have, will you maintain the deposit of faith entire and incorrupt as handed down by the apostles? On the surface, this prayer in the new rite sounds orthodox. However, it has been stripped of anything to which the Protestants can object. Remember that the Protestants claim to hold the faith handed down by the Apostles. They claim that it is the Catholic Church that has corrupted the faith of the Apostles by adding the traditions of men. Therefore, to make the office of bishop acceptable to the Protestants, the promise to keep and teach the traditions of the Orthodox Fathers and the Apostolic See had to go. The examination continues in the traditional rite. The bishop-elect is asked to profess his belief in every article of the creed. Dost thou believe that the Holy Catholic and Apostolic Church is the one true church in which the one true baptism is given and the true remission of all sins? I do believe. Professing a belief in every article of the creed had to go in the new rite. How could a novice ordo bishop profess a belief in the unity of the Church when Vatican II openly denies the unity of the Church by teaching that the true Church only subsists in the Catholic Church. Continuing with the examination in the traditional rite, the bishop is asked, Dost thou also condemn every heresy which lifteth itself up against this holy Catholic Church? I do. The duty of a bishop to condemn heresy is omitted in the new rite. No bishop in the new church would ever condemn anyone. Rather than condemning, bishops in the new church go out of their way to embrace heretics. I mean, people throw the word heresy around like, you know, it was uh, you know, a rash or something, you know, that you could think. <laughs> heresy, in my mind, is an unwillingness to live with complexity. In the traditional rite, the consecrator instructs the bishop-elect on the duties and powers of a Catholic bishop. The consecrator now addresses the bishop-elect as follows. <clears throat> it is the duty of a bishop to judge, to expound, to consecrate, to ordain, to offer sacrifice, to baptize, and to confirm. This entire prayer is omitted from the new rite. It is indeed most significant that the power to ordain and confirm has been removed from the new rite, for these are powers that are unique to the office of a bishop. Furthermore, it is of interest that the bishop's duty to judge has also been removed from the new rite. The unusually frank press conference on the flight home from Brazil covered a lot of ground over 80 minutes. But most of the press corps reported this quote from the Pope. If someone is gay and he searches for the Lord and has good will, who am I to judge? The bishop's duty to judge had to be removed from the new rite, for no novus ordo bishop would ever judge anyone. Next we have the Litany of the Saints. The Litany of the Saints was maintained in the new rite, however, even with the Litany, they did make a few changes. Prayer that follows the anointing of the bishop's head with oil in the traditional rite. Give to him, O Lord, the keys of the kingdom of heaven, that he may employ without ostentation the power which thou dost impart for edification and not for destruction. Whatsoever he shall bind on earth, be it bound also in heaven. And whatsoever he shall loose on earth, be it loosed also in heaven. Whose sins he shall retain, be they retained, and whose sins he shall remit, may they by thee be remitted.
This prayer has been entirely omitted in the New Rite. However, the New Rite does mention the power to forgive sins in the consecration prayer. Granted by the power of the Spirit of the High Priesthood, they may have the power to forgive sins according to your command, assign offices according to your decree, and loose every bond according to the power given by you to the Apostles. However, as a priest, he would already have the power to forgive sins, and so there is nothing in this prayer to indicate the unique power of a Catholic bishop. Indeed, every power unique to a Catholic bishop has been stripped from the new rite. Also note that in the traditional rite, the prayer states, Whatsoever he shall bind on earth, be it bound also in heaven, and whatsoever he shall loose on earth, be it loosed also in heaven. However, in the New Rite, the prayer only mentions the bishop's power to loose every bond, but not his power to bind. Getting a marriage annul can be a complicated process, but Pope Francis wants to make it easier. According to an announcement from the Vatican, the Holy Father appointed a commission to simplify the annulment of Catholic marriages. A Novus Ordo Bishop will loose you to do whatever you would like, but he will never bind you to your obligation to be Catholic. The prayer that follows the anointing of the bishop's head with oil continues in the traditional rite. May he never put light for darkness, nor darkness for light. May he never call evil good, nor good evil. Cardinal Timothy Dolan celebrated the inclusion of homosexuals in Thursday's St. Patrick's Day Parade. After Mayor Bill de Blasio dropped his boycott and marched in the parade, Dolan embraced de Blasio and said he's thrilled decades of division have been overcome. Cardinal Timothy Dolan, Archbishop of New York, not only applauded the decision, but gladly accepted an invitation to serve as the parade's Grand Marshal. May he never call evil good, nor good evil. Do you think that the faithful are more accepting of those marchers in the parade in 2017? I do, I think, and I think a good chunk of them were two years ago in the height of it. May he never call evil good, nor good evil. Whether the, the Catholic Church should welcome gay people into their communities. Look, you talk to the Archbishop of New York. I find it news that some people would still consider this news. May he never call evil good, nor good evil. These are ancient Christian communities. They'd have every, every right in the world to curse God. They'd have every, every right in the world to say, God has let us down. This prayer had to go in the new rite. For calling evil good and good evil seems to be the job description of a Novus Ordo Bishop. The prayer that follows the anointing of the bishop's head with oil continues in the traditional rite. Promote right. him, O Lord, to the Episcopal chair to rule thy church and the flock committed to him. This entire prayer has been removed from the new rite. In typical modernist fashion, through omission and ambiguity, the innovators were able to eliminate the Catholic concept of a bishop without openly denying it. In the new rite, as in the Protestant rite, the bishop's function has been reduced to that of an overseer. This is not to say that a bishop does not have such a function. The objection is to a rite that reduces the function of a bishop to that of only an overseer. The ceremony for the consecration of a bishop is a long and complex ritual and the issues of the validity of Paul VI's new rite may seem to be beyond the grasp of the average Catholic. However, the rules governing sacramental theology are fairly straightforward on what is required for a valid sacrament. Pius XII tells us that the form for the consecration of a bishop must clearly signify the sacramental effect, namely, the power of order and the grace of the Holy Ghost. It follows, therefore, that the form for the ordination of a bishop in Paul VI's new rite cannot be valid because the form does not signify the power of a bishop. In fact, it is not clear exactly what the new form actually does signify. So you, you end up with language in the essential sacramental form for Episcopal consecration where it is, is uh, virtually impossible to say with certainty and affirm with a straight face uh, what it actually means. Without a valid form, no sacrament can be valid. An Episcopal consecration that does not have a form which unambiguously states that the candidate will be raised to the fullness of the priesthood is no more valid 
than a baptism that does not contain the baptismal formula. Furthermore, even with the use of proper matter and form, if a sacrament is performed in a setting that denies the very nature of the sacrament, that sacrament is invalid. Consider the words of Pope Leo XIII in his bull, Apostola Curie on the invalidity of Anglican orders. He writes, For to put aside other reasons which show this to be insufficient for the purpose in the Anglican rite, let this argument suffice for all. From them has been deliberately removed whatever sets forth the dignity and office of the priesthood in the Catholic rite. That form consequently cannot be considered apt or sufficient for the sacrament, which omits what it ought essentially to signify. The deliberate removal of the Catholic concept of a bishop from the surrounding ceremonies of Paul VI's new ordination rite appears to follow the same pattern that the Anglicans used to compose their new rites. The term bishop is still employed. However, just as in the Anglican rite, every reference to the duties, function, and power of a Catholic bishop has been deliberately removed. This is a denial of the very nature of the sacrament. As Pope Leo XIII points out, that form cannot be considered as apt or sufficient for a sacrament which omits what it ought essentially to signify. The substantial meaning of the rite has been entirely removed and replaced with the Protestant one, leaving us with a rite that is almost indistinguishable from the Anglican rite. Keep in mind that Pope Leo XIII declared Anglican orders to be invalid in his apostolic bull, Apostolic Curie. He writes, we pronounce and declare that ordinations carried out according to the Anglican rite have been and are absolutely null and utterly void. There is more than sufficient evidence to conclude that the new ordination rite is invalid. However, whether one believes the rite to be valid or not, all must confess that there is at least a doubt as to its validity. It is a basic principle of sacramental theology that it is sinful for a Catholic to receive a doubtful sacrament. Therefore, doubt is enough to require Catholics to reject it. Would you go to confession to a priest who told you, your sins are probably forgiven you? Or receive communion from a priest who says, this is probably the body of Christ? Probably is just not good enough for a sacrament. Part 6. The Extraordinary Form of the Mass Many traditionally minded Catholics perceive it as a great victory that the modern Novus Ordo Church has now lifted the ban on the Latin Mass, calling it the extraordinary form of the Mass. On the surface, this may seem to be a positive occurrence. However, there are a few things to keep in mind when attending a Latin Mass offered by a Novus Ordo Church. First, and most important, is that virtually all the priests who offer what they call the extraordinary form of the Mass were ordained by bishops who were ordained using Paul VI's new and highly doubtful ordination rite. The enemies of the Church have long desired to destroy the Mass. However, they would not be satisfied in destroying the Mass alone because there was always the possibility that it could be restored at some point in the future. However, if they could eliminate the Sacrament of Holy Orders, the five sacraments that require a validly ordained minister would also eventually cease to exist. It has long been predicted that the new church would allow the Latin Mass again once there were no more priests left who could validly offer it. It is unlikely that someone ordained in Paul VI's new rite has the power to offer Mass regardless of what rite he uses. He is just a layman spouting Latin. Additionally, even if the extraordinary form of the Mass is said by a valid priest, and is a valid Mass, since the Mass is said in a Novus Ordo church, one could never be sure that the communion that is taken from the tabernacle and distributed was not consecrated at the Novus Ordo Mass. Furthermore, it is important to consider that in attending a Latin Mass offered by a Novus Ordo church, one must necessarily accept the principle that the new Mass and the traditional Mass are of equal value, and it doesn't really matter what Mass one goes to. The Novus Ordo has many options, and the extraordinary form is just another approved option. The only logical reason for attending one over the other is your personal preference. 
However, the objections to the new mass are not just based on personal preference or a nostalgic appreciation for Latin, but rather on questions of doctrine and validity. Consider just a few of the problems with the new mass. Not only does the offertory prayer not offer the sacrifice to atone for sin, the prayer never does clearly state any purpose for the offering. The prayer states, We have received the bread we offer you, but it never does state why it is offered. It is true that the new rite is still called a sacrifice, but the rite has been stripped of any hint that it is a sacrifice offered to atone for sin. At best, it is a Protestant-style sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. Jesus died on the cross to atone for sin. The Mass is a renewal of Jesus' passion and death on the cross. If a rite is not offered to atone for sin, it cannot be a renewal of Jesus' passion and death on the cross. A liturgy that is not offered to atone for sin is therefore not a Mass. Yet to attend the extraordinary form of the Mass, one must agree in principle that the new Mass and the traditional Mass are of equal value. The general instruction for the new Mass calls the words of consecration the institution narrative. If the words of consecration are only a narrative, the priest is no longer offering sacrifice. He becomes a narrator who reads the story of the Last Supper. Yet to attend the extraordinary form of the Mass, one must agree in principle that the new Mass and the traditional Mass are of equal value. In the new Mass, the words mystery of faith are no longer part of the consecration formula. The words are still there, but they have been moved outside the consecration and now serve as an introduction to a memorial acclamation. In the traditional rite, the words mystery of faith are a profession of faith, that the bread and wine are transformed into the body and blood of Christ. By moving these words outside the consecration, their meaning has changed. They are no longer a profession of faith and transubstantiation. They are now a memorial acclamation, which is just a gospel narrative. Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ will someday return. This is an implied denial of the doctrine of transubstantiation. Yet to attend the extraordinary form of the Mass, one must agree in principle that the new Mass and the traditional Mass are of equal value. Nowhere in the new rite is there an unambiguous profession of faith that the bread and wine are transformed into the body and blood of Christ. Consider that the general instruction to the new Mass tells us that Christ is really present in the very liturgical assembly gathered in his name, in the person of the minister, in his words, and indeed substantially and continuously under the Eucharistic species. They have introduced confusion about the doctrine of Christ's true presence in the Eucharist by introducing the idea that Christ is present in many different ways. Ambiguity has also been introduced into the phrase body of Christ in the communion rite. It is not clear if the phrase body of Christ is referring to the Eucharist or the assembly. There are many prayers in the New Mass that have a double or doubtful meaning. Keep in mind that deliberate ambiguity is fundamentally dishonest. A fundamentally dishonest liturgy is an offense to God. Yet to attend the extraordinary form of the Mass, one must agree in principle that the new Mass and the traditional Mass are of equal value. The new Mass is blasphemous, distributing communion in the hand to people who are standing. Keep in mind that the 16th century Protestant, Thomas Cramner, introduced communion in the hand as a way of denying Christ's true presence in the Eucharist. Furthermore, Canon 844.4 of the 1983 Code of Canon Law even allows the administration of Holy Communion to non-Catholics. To administer Holy Communion to a non-Catholic is an implicit denial of the dogma. Outside the Catholic Church, there is no salvation. Yet to attend the extraordinary form of the Mass, one must agree in principle that the new Mass and the traditional Mass are of equal value. The new Mass also introduces the concept of the Mass as a Supper, calling it the Supper of the Lamb. The Mass is not a supper. The phrase Lord's Supper was a term used by the 16th century Protestant reformers to distinguish their new services from a Catholic Mass. Yet to attend the extraordinary form of the Mass, one must agree in principle that the new Mass and the traditional Mass are of equal value. 
The prayers of the new Mass have a consistent theme, the deliberate removal of anything to which Protestants may object. That is to say, they removed anything that was uniquely Catholic. The new rite has removed such Catholic concepts as the true sacrificial nature of the Mass, the divinity of Christ, our Lord's true presence in the Eucharist, and much, much more. The new Mass has many options, depending on which option is used. Between 60 and 80 percent of the traditional Mass has simply been removed. Through ambiguity and the deliberate removal of uniquely Catholic doctrines, they have transformed the new liturgy into a collection of nice generic prayers that are virtually indistinguishable from any other Protestant Eucharistic celebration. Yet to attend the extraordinary form of the Mass, one must agree in principle that the new Mass and the traditional Mass are of equal value. Even if the new Mass were valid, the deliberate removal of all the uniquely Catholic doctrines is a blasphemous denial of faith. Attendance at a blasphemous service is a direct offense to God. It is far better to attend no service than a service that is offensive to God. Allowing a Latin Mass again has proven to be a most effective tool for controlling any meaningful opposition. The strategy seems to be absorb the resistance to modernism by offering them a Latin Mass sign chapel. In exchange for the Latin Mass sign chapel, the opposition must be silent about all the modernist heresy going on on the main altar. The resistance is effectively neutralized. The seeds of division are sown among traditional Catholics, and the revolution can continue unopposed. Resistance to the new Mass has in many ways become the face of resistance to the revolution. It is important to keep in mind that it is not the Mass, but rather the profession of one faith that makes one a Catholic. One can be a Catholic and save their soul, even if the Mass were taken away. However, one cannot be a Catholic without the Catholic faith. The Catholic Church is the Bride of Christ without spot or wrinkle. She cannot be made subject to compromise. We cannot settle for a mutilated version of the faith. We cannot settle for a hybrid church somewhere between Orthodox Catholicism and Modernism. We must insist on a church that professes the Catholic faith whole and entire without any hint of compromise. There are those who defend the validity of the new Mass and the new ordination rite, not on their merits, but on the grounds that they were promulgated with the authority of a Pope. It is true that a valid Pope cannot promulgate a false sacramental rite. However, this line of reasoning is a double-edged sword and cuts both ways. For if the new Mass and new ordination rite are invalid, it necessarily follows that the man who promulgated them cannot be a true Pope.
Oh,